Now let's go straight to uh, Mr. Uh, the first presentation it will be by uh, Mr. Fabio Donati uh, from the IBS Center for Quantum uh, Quantum Nanoscience Department of Physics in Korea. Oh, it should be very late now in Korea. And he's going to show to us a design of a coplanar waveguide resonator for electron spin resonance experiment using HF rocks. First of all, uh, thanks thanks a lot for this invitation. Uh, I'm really excited to attend this this event, although it's a bit late here in Korea. Uh, but uh, thanks uh, a lot for Ian Morse for, oh, <laughs> for inviting sure. thank me. Thank you, and thank you. And it's our yeah. pleasure and oh, honor to have you with us today. Yeah. So. Um, um, as, as, uh, as also introduced by, by uh, uh, the chair of this session, uh, I, I'm Fabio Donati. I'm from Italy, but actually I'm working in Korea in the Center for Quantum Nanoscience. So uh, let me see if I can move to the next page. So I wanted to show um, a picture uh, of the building I'm, I'm, I'm working. Now I'm at home because it's a bit late. But So this building is, uh, is the building for our center. It's located in Seoul. In, uh, in South Korea, and it's actually very, very new. Uh, we finished the construction two years ago. Uh, we had the opening ceremony in 2019, and in this center, we uh, we study what we, uh, as you see from the name, we study quantum nanoscience. What is this science about? Well, it's a mixture between uh, quantum science and nanoscience, so uh, the science of objects at the nanoscales. And then I wanted to uh, make use of this presentation to. Um, show how we could um, develop our, our, our science uh, using the support of HFWorks to design our, uh, our parts of the setup. So first of all, maybe I, I want to give you an hint of what we are, what is the object of study of our center. So we study, is, we study materials that uh, are meant to work as qubits. Now, maybe some of you know what is a, a qubit, but just to be everybody on the same ground, I want to make a distinction between uh, what is a classical bit, which is a bit of information, a two-state object with zero and one, from which we can operate in a binary. Muted. And so this is typical, the typical, uh, um, let's say, unitary object for classical logical operation. But then uh, more recently, there are devices that operate in a, in a, in a quantum uh, fashion. So these are called qubits. This, the way they, this uh, object operates is that not only we have uh, the two classical states, the zero and the one, but we can also have this object into in an intermediate, let's say we more technically we call it a superposition state. So in these superposition states, the qubit can perform logic operation in a different way. So these are called quantum logic operations. Um, I don't want to go too much into details about how this qubit operates, but I wanted to give you uh, just an example of what is happening in the world in, in terms of quantum computers. There are big companies investing um, investing a lot in this uh, in this field. One is IBM. There is also Google, Microsoft, Intel. So the big uh, micro uh, micro microelectronic company they are investing a lot in this. And the benchmark that they have now is the number of qubits, the number of, of bits that they can use as, as, a, as a CPU for, for this calculation. So the present record, I think, is, is from IBM that can have 65 qubits, but it's evolving very fast. So I tried to check today. I, this is the best I could find, but I'm pretty sure in the next month this number will increase again. So what are these machines about? So they are not like our personal computer. They are actually quite quite large size. They they have the size of a room. So we may compare the way they work. So pretty much the way uh, computers in the 60s and the 70s used to operate. So they are still um, mostly prototype. They work in uh, under under lab condition. Essentially, they require extremely low temperature. Let's say 10 millikelvin. At the moment, we use this machine mostly to test what we call quantum algorithm. So what, what is the goal of this quantum algorithm? The um, potential for this algorithm would be to solve uh, problems that are um, very complex. And then with classical logic, we could take uh, too, too much time. So the time for solving this problem is too long. And by operating this uh, quantum logic, which essentially allows to operate all this qubit in parallel, we can make our calculation more efficient. More, more efficient, especially in terms uh, when we it comes to point like climate simulation, uh, cryptography, and other complex problems. Now, since this is a very rapidly devol uh, developing field, there is a lot of room for unexplored um, uh, um, uh, direction for, for the research. And in one of the directions sits our research line. So what we are trying to do in our center is to 
explore the possibilities of using molecules as qubits. So how, how would this work? So the molecules that you see here uh, drawn on my sketch are this, this uh, fancy object. They should be placed on some uh, metal surface in this case. And then uh, um, we make use of uh, the electrons, the electron spins inside the molecules. Uh, as you know, electrons can behave as little, uh, very tiny magnets. And when we apply an external magnetic field, so these blue lines here, so the magnetic field, the magnetic uh, dipole of our electron align along the external field. But then we can use the microwave power generated by, by our surface, if we send the power correctly, to manipulate this spin. Now, maybe let me try to see if I can um, run a little cartoon about that. So the way it works is, is the following. So when we apply the magnetic field, um, the, um, the spin aligns along the magnetic field the line. But then with the microwave, the absorption of the magnetic, the oscillating magnetic field of the microwave uh, with respect to the spin, essentially move, provides a, a torque on the spin that makes them rotating uh, along, along a, a certain trajectory. Now, when this process happens, we call it electron spin resonance. And we can detect it by, by a, a characteristic signal in the power that is absorbed in our device. Now, we can just operate in this way that I just shown, which is called continuous wave, or we can also use it in a slightly smarter way, so we can coordinate um, the duration of our microwave in very short pulses. And then by tuning this duration properly, we can set our electron into an intermediate state. So this intermediate state is the one we would need to perform our quantum calculations. So when the electrons are in this condition, they emit a specific echo that we can detect in our device. So the intensity of this echo, the echo actually um, decreases with time because slowly all the electron spin will tend to align back to the original position. So the longer we can keep our electron spins in the intermediate state, the longer we can perform quantum calculations. So then we have a lot of physics to study about, but the way to do, that we do it is by sending microwave through a device that you see here, which is uh, uh, our um, coplanar wave guide resonator. And then the, as the microwave move through the transmission line, it reaches the the, the, the region where we have our molecule, we can emit the microwave here in this region and then use it to control the spin of our molecules. So this was about the physics, but then you understand that we have to make a proper design of this device, of this resonator, um, to perform our operation efficiently. So with this, the cartoon is over, let me come back to the presentation. And I wanted to first, uh, before starting with the, with the presentation of the technical part, I wanted to thank all the members of the team that followed me in this year. In particular for, for this work, I want to thank Ye Jin Zhang. She was a, a graduate student in my group for, for two years. Also, she, was, she joined my group even before when she was an undergraduate student. And now she's assistant manager in the research and development uh, uh, sector of a Korean company, Technology Engine of Science. So uh, most of the work you will see today uh, was done by her uh, that she she got a lot of experience using HF works. So this is um, a sketch of the machine that we use to perform our experiment. So this is an overview of our machine. It took a couple of years to uh, design and realize all the parts. We have our um, magnet here, uh, three Tesla cryogenic magnet, cryogenic free magnet that can provide the static field that we use to align our spins. Then we have a cryostat that operates from 2.5 to 300 Kelvin. We have to operate in extremely low pressure. So we have to use a special technology called the ultra vacuum for this setup. And then we connect everything to a preparation chamber here, which is actually the place where we prepare our resonator and samples. So let me also turn on again the laser pointer. The typical frequency we use for our experiment then is in the microwave range. It's the X band uh, between eight and 12 gigahertz. So this is also a picture of the machine uh, completed. Uh, this is a picture from, from this year where everything is, is connected and completed. Now, the main part that requires the design and the approach for uh, HF4 is the, the uh, microwave resonator. So this is the Coplana wave guide resonator type with double grounded. So we have ground uh, um, plate on, on the side and also ground plate below. And as I explained to you before, we have our a microwave transmitted on this line, and then 
we confine the microwave through um, re resonating condition here, essentially when we match the standing wave condition for which uh, half of the wavelength matches the, the sample length here, then we have uh, our uh, resonance condition for which the microwave is confined and emitted here where we have our sample. Now on a profile, we expect the distribution of the magnetic field which is parallel to the surface like this. And the critical parameter for the design here are the different gaps between um, the metal parts. So the gap between the transmission line and the sample part, the gaps between uh, the metal part and, um, and the, 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 the ground plate and also the thickness of our, uh, of our dielectric. So what is also what we understood is extremely critical is the separation between the transmission line and the sample part because this defines the coupling of the microwave. So some of the parameters we have to uh, optimize such to get proper matching in terms of 50 ohm transmission also with the coaxial cable that we connect here. But then other parts we have to tune until we get the, uh, the, the performance we, we require. So in order to see the performance of the device, we look into the reflected power. So this is just one port device. So we look at the S11 parameter for the, for the device. So let me show them some example and some result of our simulation. So this is the first prototype realized of our um, resonator. It's done with a printed circuit board, so PCB material here. We chose this, this material because it's easy to machine realize the different parts. We can use this technology of the laminated copper, which is very well established, and we can use it to solder our power without with any problem. So it's extremely suitable to realize prototypes. Now, here comes the part where we wanted to understand how uh, the microwave propagates inside and, and works in our device. So we simulated our problem with the HF forks. As you see here, we set a volume of air with the radiation boundary condition. This turned out to be very important because our device ultimately is, is sort of an antenna. So we emit the microwave here at this spot. So we need to be careful in defining the boundary condition of our simulation. And also we uh, consider imperfect electric conductor everywhere we have copper and, and gold here in the, in the connector. So here are all the parameters we used for our simulation and the materials. And here is also another important point that we learned from our simulation is the, the mesh control. So it's extremely important to define in our simulation <clears throat> the a very precise uh, mesh control between the metal part and the electric part because this is also where you have a change of boundary conditions. So we set uh, the, one of the smallest possible element size of 0.1 millimeter here. And actually this was an excellent suggestion from, uh, from uh, the, the engineering team of HF, uh, HF Works because uh, before that um, we were not setting this precision and the results were very different. Let me compare uh, what we obtained with also our experiment. So um, with, the, with the blue line, you see here the S11 parameter of the calculated, calculated from the model using the right, uh, so the, 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 the best precision for the element size at the edges between the metal and the dielectric. With the red line, you see our performance of our resonator. So this is the SS, S11 parameter. The frequency is slightly different, but the two quality factor of the resonance are quite close one to each other. Now, as a comparison, I wanted to show uh, our first attempt without uh, setting the proper uh, mesh uh, precision on, on the edges. You see, this is the green line. So we are very far off with the frequency, but also with the Q factor. So thanks a lot to uh, the engineering team from the HF Force. They gave a big hand in this, in this study. Now, I could show a more result on this, but actually, I, I, due to limited time, I wanted to move on and show also um, the next step of our research. So instead of using this PCB resonator, we actually uh, moved to another kind of uh, resonator, which is um, sapphire-based and is copper-coated. We wanted to use sapphire because um, of essentially two reasons. As you have seen from my uh, specification of, of the machine, we tend to operate at low temperature. So the, the PCB board is normally very poor uh, thermal conductors, whereas sapphire at low temperature is a very, it's a, it's a quite, quite good thermal conductor. So we use this to reach low temperature and also we use this because we have the need of staying very low with pressure. So we need the material which has very low outgas rate. In turns, sapphire has a higher dielectric constant. So it, this means it can confine the microwave more tightly in a smaller volume of space. Again, we approach our problem by uh, modeling with solid works and then simulating with, with HF works using the, the parameter that I show here in the table. 
And, and here, it's, uh, it was even more instructive to see the behavior the way we simulated from H HF4s. Now, you see that differently from the PCB resonator, we have a series of resonances here. So first of all, we need to understand what, are the, what is the origin of these resonances. So for doing that, we visualize the distribution of the, electric, of the magnetic field, of the oscillating magnetic field on our device. So here is what we have. Um, from the simulation. So this is the cut, um, the section of, of the um, distribution of the, of the magnetic field exactly on the surface of the resonator. And this is right above the surface, like 0.2 millimeter above the surface. Now to understand how is this working, so, so this is uh, the region where you see the, the most intense uh, magnetic field is our sample part. And now we can see what happens if we take again the section of our uh, schematics that I showed in the beginning. So when we cut our magnetic field um, exactly at the surface plane like this, we have essentially no magnetic field uh, in, the, in the metal parts, which is expected. And then we have the maximum of the intensity of the magnetic field in the, dielectric, in the gap here where we, where, we, where, we, where, we, where we have the dielectric. And then if we cut instead the section right above our, our the, uh, resonator plate here, then we see that the maximum of the magnetic field is localized exactly in the middle of our um, straight line. So this tells us that we, with this resonance, we can localize the magnetic field in the sample part. So this is the resonance we should use to perform our experiment. We also verified what happens at the other resonance here, the most prominent one here. And you see that in this case, it doesn't, we don't hit the resonance of our, um, of our strip line, but actually we are spreading the uh, electromagnetic wave inside the sapphire part due to the high dielectric component that the sapphire can contain, uh, can um, confine in the, in the volume, the electromagnetic field. And as a result, if we probe then uh, the magnetic field right above the surface, we see that we don't send enough power where we have the sample here. We lose essentially the power on the way and we spread our power inside our, our resonator. So this is actually not suitable for, for our experiment. And actually when we measure um, the S1 parameter for our real device, we see that we have two resonances, one very close to the one simulated here, one a bit higher in, in, uh, in frequency, but it turns out that these two are actually corresponding pretty much as our simulation. This is the resonance of the strip line, and this is the resonance within the sapphire. So we set the operation mode for our machine in this, in this frequency. And with that, we could successfully measure uh, all the characteristics we needed for our resonator. So we could detect the electron spin resonance in continuous wave and with a sensitivity which goes down to one single layer of molecules. And then we can also perform pulsed ESR um, operation. Now, I think my time is, is over, so I just wanted to conclude with the one final slide because from the experience we had from working with HF works, we also understood what are the critical point of the design, especially the coupling between the transmission line and the, and, um, and the sample part. And so we could also develop a new, um, new uh, sample design and more optimized uh, geometry for our experiment. With this, I want to conclude my presentation. Again, thanks uh, EM Works for inviting me and you for, for the attention.